The poll bugle has been sounded and in these elections, one of the issues which has taken center stage is Citizenship Amendment Act, the notification for, for which was issued on 11th of March. The opposition has called it dangerous and draconian. The BJP says it supports citizenship on humanitarian grounds. There are also a batch of petitions which will be taken up by the Apex Court on 19th, challenging CAA. We have India's top legal eagle, Harish Salve, joining us to answer all these questions on its legal validity. Mr. Salve, pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time here on NDTV. My first question, there is little doubt that India's partition on religious lines did throw up several challenges and citizenship for refugees in one of them, which the Citizenship Amendment Act intends to address. Despite several assurances, the Nehru Liaquat Pact and subsequent demands from every political party, including the Congress and communists, there has been strong resistance to the law. My question to you, sir, is, is CAA compliant with constitutional morality? Yeah, it is uh, compliant with the constitution and with legality and constitutional morality. But I want to start by addressing a very interesting expression you used. Uh, you said they call it draconian. As lawyers, uh, at least, we normally use the word draconian on something which imposes on a citizen's liberty. So if the government gives one gas cylinder free in three months, and somebody says you should give one gas cylinder every month, or if government gives only to a part of India and somebody says give it to the whole of India, the decision to give one gas cylinder in three months or to a part of India, you will not call it draconian. You will say, this is, this is not enough. You must do equally for all. So this word draconian, I think, comes out of a, out of a, a bag of expressions without understanding the connotation. In constitutional law, draconian is a provision of, for example, a law which says you will not get bail unless proved innocent. Prima facie. Now, that's what we call draconian because that imposes on a citizen's liberty. Anyway, let's talk of first constitutional legal morality and then talk of constitutional legality. The Home Minister has explained the context of the law. The context of the law is there, are, <clears throat> there was an Indian subcontinent prior to 1947. Afghanistan was very much a part of it. Pakistan was very much a part of it. India was very much a part of it. Bangla, what is now Bangladesh was very much a part of it. And this was liberal. Of course, there were principalities, there were this, but never really was there a problem. We know in India, India has always been liberal. My wife comes from Afghanistan. She grew up as a little girl in the 60s and 70s and Afghanistan, she says, it was a very liberal society where their understanding was first the family, then the community, and then the religion. Now, things changed. Things changed in Pakistan, which has declared itself an Islamic state. Things have changed in Bangladesh, which calls itself an Islamic state, an Islamic republic. And Afghanistan, we all know the, the misfortune of Afghanistan under the Taliban. In a situation like this, if India says, and the Home Minister has given figures, of how the non-Islamic population in these countries has dropped dramatically. So if India says, all right, people who are of Indian ethnicity, and when I say India, I mean the Indian subcontinent ethnicity, hmm. the Zoroastrians, Parsis, as we call them, Sikhs, Christians, Hindus, they will get fast-track citizenship in the sense if they come in and they have some proof, and a large number of them are already in India. Come, come in as refugees because they are not entitled to practice their own re religion, be it Hinduism, be it Zoroastrianism, be it uh, uh, Sikhism, freely in these Islamic states. Because by definition, a theocratic state has a state religion and other religions are not encouraged. In fact, they are positively discouraged. So if we say we will give them fast track citizenship, and we will fit them into Indian society. I don't see where the constitutional morality gets offended by this. Hmm. Hmm. And let's take it a little ahead, uh, Mr. Salve. And one of the charges leveled against CAA is that it is discriminatory. 
that it prioritizes so non-Muslims over other religions, namely Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, uh, Buddhists, Parsis and Jains. And there are some who argue that Rohingyas, Ahmadiyas and even Shias have faced discrimination and hence they should also be welcomed. What is your opinion? So let me on answer it? the discrimination point, which is the second point which you raised, constitutional legality. Hmm. Constitutional legality is discrimination under the constitution doesn't mean everybody has to be given the same. Correct? We pay different rates of tax depending on income. That's not discrimination. The, the people below a particular income level are given so many things which are not given to others. We should be today an ideal welfare state. Look at the Nordic states. Finest education is free. All, all health care is free. Won't India want to do that? Of course, someday we want to do that. But today you have to be below a particular income level. You give it because it's a question of resources. What the argument of discrimination is that if you make, if you differentiate between people. This is what we constitutional lawyers call overclassification. That is, there are people of the same class who are being left out of a benefit being given, then you call it discrimination. For this, it becomes very necessary to define a class. The principle is, if you make a differentiation, differential treatment, that must have a nexus with the object to be achieved. What is the class? The class is minorities in Islamic states, the three neighboring Islamic states. That's the class. What is the object to be achieved? That minorities in an Islamic state are by definition, hmm. by definition of theocratic states, treated differently from majorities, from the state religion. So that's the class and the object sought to be achieved is these are minorities of Indian ethnicity who are discriminated against by definition. And therefore, we fit them in. So the objects are to be achieved is to fit in the minorities of these three neighboring states. And the class is minorities of these three. It subserves the object. So it's perfectly constitutionally permissible in my point of view. Now, let's deal with the Rohingya or the Ahmadiyya argument. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, it is possible that even within a theocratic state, hmm. in the state religion, people are treated differently. But can you deny the fact that in a state religion, there is a state religion and there is a religion which is not encouraged by the state, in fact, which is discouraged by the state. These are two, these are the classification. We are not fixing the problems of the Islamic faith. It, we would be stepping out of line if we were to do that. How would somebody like if Pakistan said, you know, certain communities in, in Hindus are not properly treated in India, we will give them free citizenship and you will give them money. We'll say, don't poke your nose in our affairs. Islam is a religion. And if Islam is not being properly administered, it is for the Islamic people of Islamic faith to fix that. Uh, is India going to sit? Are we, are we playing America? We are getting into Pakistan and saying, we know you're an Islamic state, but you know what? You're not truly Islamic because you treat certain parts of Islam differently from other parts of Islam. Is that our place? Is it our place to say that? So I don't understand this argument. The Rohingya is a completely different problem. The Rohingya, Rohingya are the Bangladeshis who were imported into Burma. Most of our problems are created by the old British colonial Raj. The British colonial Raj got these poor Bangladeshis to work in Burma. Burma says, go back to Bangladesh. That's a territorial problem between two of them. They happen to be Muslims because they are Bangladeshis. Should we open our border to all? I wish, I wish God had endowed us with the resources to wipe every tear from every eye. But Article 14 doesn't say, unless you can wipe every tear from every eye, don't wipe any tears at all. Mr. Salve, let's look at some more arguments which have been put forth by those who are opposing it. Uh, sure. They are saying that this is arbitrary in how the provisions of the law which have been framed. These, these uh, you know, the, those who are opposing, they say that why just include Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh and exclude Myanmar, for example, which also shares border with India. And if we were to pick countries arbitrarily, then why not include Sri Lanka too? 
this is there's nothing arbitrary. It's a question of how much you can afford to give. First of all, Sri Lanka is not a theocratic republic, at least till th this morning. And Myanmar is not a theocratic republic, at least till this morning, or this evening for you in India. So I don't know what we are talking about. We are talking of discrimination in a theocratic republic, treating the religions differently. Are we saying there are no other problems? Let's extend the logic further. The African tribes, certain African tribes are treated so badly in Congo, in Ethiopia. We should open it to them also. What about ethnic? What about the people from Syria who are being slaughtered? What about people from Gaza? Why, why, why not open it up to all Palestinians to come and stay freely in India? I wish we could. I wish we could wipe the tear from every eye. But we can't. But that doesn't mean, therefore, that if we have three neighboring countries which have turned theocratic, and because they've turned theocratic, there is a large ethnic Indian population there, which are minorities, we fit them in. How does that become discriminatory? All you're saying is we should do more. And if we have the resources, we could do more. That's a matter of state policy. And uh, how does this act work? Because it's not applicable to the tribal areas of Assam, Mizoram, Meghalaya or Tripura. Because as is included in the sixth schedule of the constitution and the area covered under the inner line uh, notified under the Bengal Eastern no, Frontier I, Regulation 1873. I, I, don't, I don't understand how this... I mean, could you explain is why is it so, sir? Because there is the no, no, argument around that, that. First of all, at least till this morning, and I've heard this uh, being aired... States are saying, we will not acknowledge this law. We will not work this law. How will this law work in a tribal area? What does this law say? You will be a citizen of India and you will be subject to the same restriction as a citizen of India. Correct? You will apply to the home ministry on a portal. You will be called for an interview. You give an interview if you are able to establish that you fit within the uh, class which is to be benefited. You will get Indian citizenship. And you will be like any other Indian citizen. I heard Kerala saying we will not implement this law. What are they going to say? Sorry, we are going to check your passport. If your passport came under the CAA, you're not a you're not an Indian. Can state say that? I don't know where this argument is coming from. All you all you you'll be an Indian citizen, right? Whereas the question of tribal area, non-tribal area, this area, that area, you're not getting any special benefits. No? Like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, a number of them are saying that they will they not be. They have no role to play. I'm sorry, citizenship is a union subject. It is not for implementation in the states. There is going to be an online portal. And the online portal you fill in. And if the union government wants to set up offices in a state to implement a union law, no state can say, I will not allow this. Can tomorrow a state say, I will not allow enforcement directory to enter my state. I will not allow CBI to enter my state. I will not allow CRPF to enter my state. Can you say that in a, in a federal like a federation like India? See, the most danger, this is a dangerous argument. Okay, you know, there are opposition parties like the Trinamool Congress, which is alleging that CAA is a precursor to NRC. And just like the Supreme Court appointed committee excluded 13 lakh Bengalis during the NRC exercise in Assam, similar fate could be met by others. Now, if, look, I am not an astrologer, nor am I a political pundit. So if the CAA, if, if what, if CAA is a precursor to a NRC, if somebody sees it that way, it's a political argument. I don't want to get into it. There is a CAA and there is an NRC. And the two operate in two separate fields. The legality of one doesn't impinge on or support the legality of the other. So as a lawyer, I have no answer to this. If somebody says your motive is you're ultimately going somewhere, that's a political argument. The political class will deal with it. Mr. Salve, the United States has expressed concerns about the notification uh, and they have said that they are monitoring the implementation of this act. The United Nations has called the legislation fundamentally discriminatory in nature. Of course, the Indian government has responded by calling their concerns misplaced and misinformed. But how let do you me, look at this concern let being me expressed it at all? Straight away. I think the Americans should right now worry about 
their support to Israel and what's happening to the Palestinians. The Americans should worry about the race issues in America. And the Americans should worry about the fact that on the one hand, they are hunting Donald Trump. And the other hand, he's likely to become president of America. Right now, America should have enough of its own. Why is it worried about what's going on in India? We are a democracy. We change governments by ballot. And everything is going well. Last time, by if you go by what Don, Donald Trump said, they didn't change the government by ballot. So I, I think America needs to worry about itself. As far as Pakistan is concerned, if they call it discriminatory, I say, shame on you. I say, shame on you for the reason, are you acknowledging that Ahmadiyyas are treated badly and they should also be included in the CAA in India? What is Pakistan saying? That why aren't you allowing Muslims from my country to become your citizens? That's the argument. I say, Pakistan, shame on you. Mr. Salve, in 72 hours, Supreme Court will hear petitions challenging CAA. Uh, 237 petitions in all. It will be taken up on 19th of March. Uh, when there are existing laws and provisions to provide citizenship, the question that is asked is why CAA at all? Uh, that's that's a rhetoric, that's a rhetoric, and the political rhetoric will answer that. The CA addresses a specific problem. I do not know of any law which says uh, preferential fast track uh, citizenship to this class of people. So that's the short answer. I have only one thing to say: if there are two hundred and thirty seven petitions, and the poor Supreme Court judges have to hear two hundred and thirty seven lawyers, my heart reaches out to them. And. Questioning it on the point that it is violative of Article 14 of the Constitution? Yeah, of course, then. I don't say my view is the right view. I say this is my view. That's why I'm asking you, Doctor, uh, uh, Mr. Salve, because you'll be able no, to help us view. understand to whether it will st stand the test of legal scrutiny. According to me, it should. And I think I'm right. But I have the intellectual honesty to admit. So I may be wrong. I never thump the table and say I'm right. I'm not a politician. I'm a lawyer. Yes, that's I have won why... cases. I have lost cases. I have won cases which I was not very sure I'd win. And I have lost cases which I was very sure I would win. So we know law. It, it, these are intellectual uh, issues. I have expressed my view. I very strongly feel this law is constitutional. But I'm not a Supreme Court judge. And I'm not going to be hearing the case. Okay, so let's let's elaborate a little bit more on that since you're talking about uh, the constitutional law and uh, how it doesn't really violate. It, it will stand the test of legal scrutiny. Uh, Mr. Salve, how does it actually work then for all those who are opposing it, saying that it is against the Muslims of India? Or is this more of a misinformation campaign? So let's, let's, let's just hear what you just said. It's against the Muslims of India. That Muslims of Pakistan and Afghanistan are not being given open citizenship into India is against the Muslims of India is a logic I have not understood. It may be against the interest of some people who want to encourage this and let's not get into the politics of that. But how giving free citizenship to Ahmadiyyas, which is the main argument on discrimination or, or Shias, would benefit the Muslims of India as an argument, I fail to understand. So, if, 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 to me, the argument in cold logic doesn't get off the ground. So, would you say that uh, all these concerns that are being expressed by be it United States or Human Rights Watch Group of concerns of, uh, you know, religious freedom in India, which comes up every now and then, Tell me, will America will America give open citizenship rights to Ahmadiyyas of Pakistan? And if it is not going to do so, will it give open citizenship open citizenship rights to the poor Palestinians who are being mercilessly slaughtered? If it is not, then I say America shut out. Mr. Salve. Would you say that this is a law whose time has come, particularly at the juncture at which India is standing? There, there's no right time and there's no wrong time. We had to do it. It should have been done earlier. 
maybe it should have been done 20, 25 years earlier, it would not have been this controversial. Today, politics is a lot more uh, sharply divided. So it's, it's this. I mean, if it had been done 25 years ago and 30 years ago, and if the Congress had done it, you would have had no rights. Let's be clear about that. Is it of because- course, they will say we would never have done it. But there are uh, there are earlier debates where people said we should be doing something like this. Hmm. And so it is being done. Yeah, so it's being done, it's being done. So constitutional morality test, it passes. Constitutional legality test, it, it passes. Where is the concern then? As, as, a, uh, as the top legal is, voice of the country. Concern is what was announced. Maria, you know, concern is what was announced yesterday. What's going to happen in April and May? This is a, you raise issues. I mean, this is this is the joy of Indian politics and Indian elections. You have all sorts of issues. Things heat up, not necessarily logical, more rhetorical. But that's and true true for any part of the world. Elections always create a time for a boil of ideas. So that's that's the main concern. My last question to you. I am going- reasonably certain after June this will be a non-issue. Okay, so you're saying by June it will be a non-issue after fourth yeah. of June when the elections are over. It might it might come back to life when certain states go to the polls, but okay, so, uh, sir, you haven't answered what question that I'd asked, and I'm going to go sure, back to sure. it. Why CAA sure. when there are existing laws and provisions to provide citizenship? Because those laws have a very different protocol and a very different rigor under which citizenship is granted. It is here you have said from those on who we are granted and we, our citizenship is open to any and everybody, but it's on certain protocols, there are guidelines how we grant citizenship. This is granted on a basis. And the basis is A, you're a member of, you're a citizen of one of these countries and B, you belong to a community, which is the minority community in those countries. These are the two tests if you satisfy you get citizenship unless you're established to be a security threat or something like that. So it's a much simplified version of giving citizenship. Doesn't every country have it? Doesn't the U.S. have different rules on which they give green cards and U.S. citizenship? Britain has separate rules. And there are five or six different categories in which you are given visas. So every country has different norms and different rules on which they give citizenship. Mr. Salvi, a final thought? My final thought is that it's it's a it's a good measure. It's uh, at, at this time no idea will go unchallenged in the next two months, and I am always I'm very proud of India because you know uh, I'll just close with one thought since you are talking about Pakistan and their concerns. I believe uh, not exact words. Bhutto wrote. That he used to, uh, sorry, Pilu Modi, the famous Indian uh, politician, he wrote that Bhutto was his friend from England where they were studying. And he said, Bhutto wrote to him once, he said, I used to always scoff the noise and dust of Indian democracy. But when I lie in this dark, quiet cell in Pakistan, I now realize the value of the noise and dust of democracy. What better way to end this uh, conversation, Mr. Salve? Pleasure speaking to you, sir. Thank you for your time and uh, breaking down this entire idea called CAA and its implementation. That's all from me. Thanks so much for watching.